Okay, hi everyone. We're going to get started. Um, my name is Joe O'Connor. I work with Force the Trade Union as the Director of Campaigning, and I'm also the Chairperson of the Four Day Week Ireland Campaign Steering Group, um, which is a campaign that we launched around this time last year, uh, which is a coalition of trade unions um, representing workers, businesses, uh, environmentalists, women, academics, and other civil society organisations. And we're campaigning for a gradual steady transition to a shorter working week for all workers in the public and private sector here in Ireland. Um, so just, I suppose, by way of background, this campaign is something that, that came together originally as a result of, I suppose, the international evidence and examples which have been emerging from many businesses who have trialled or introduced a shorter working week in recent years. Um, and also many uh, government ministers filed this. Um, and we've seen huge benefits to a four day working week, both for workers in terms of their health and well-being, um, and also the time that they, they have to spend with their families, with their communities, uh, for other projects. For employers in terms of the results showing that employees have been more focused, more motivated, and more productive in many examples that we've seen where a four day week has been introduced. For the environment where a lot of research shows that we can reduce carbon emissions and make a huge contribution to our collective fight against climate change and um, through a uh, reduction in working hours. And also for women, whereby from a gender equality point of view, uh, reducing working hours can enable men to spend more time uh, at home uh, sharing care work within the family and also enabling women to take on more senior leadership positions at work. So what I want to do just by, by way of introduction is just to take you through a short presentation um, which goes through the survey results that we're releasing today. Uh, it's the first survey of its type here in Ireland on public attitudes to a four day working week um, and it has some very interesting findings. After that, I'm going to invite in um, Margaret Cox, who's the director of the ICE group, uh, a business based in Galway, but located in a number of, of different parts of the country, who have introduced a four day working week since early last year. Um, Orla O'Connor, the director of the National Women's Council, and Oshin Coughlin, who's the director of Friends of the Earth Ireland. Um, after we've heard from our speakers, I'm going to give an opportunity to uh, representatives from, I think, each of the main political parties uh, who are joining us here this morning, and um, just a, a short response to the contributions and to the survey results and, and any questions that they wish to ask. And then I'll open it up to the other attendees where you can ask questions through the Q&A chat box and we'll be picking them up and we'll hopefully get to them later in the hour. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay, so maybe people might indicate it's just sharing now so people can indicate if they can see it okay. You should be seeing a slide now with four day week public attitude study. Okay, so this uh, public poll is something that, that as a campaign we felt felt was worthy of, of commissioning. Uh, off the back of similar research that has been conducted in the UK uh, this summer and also industry studies and, uh, and studies that we've done in our own trade union in Forza which showed a very significant appetite for a four day working week. Um, but to date, there hasn't been a, a publicly representative survey done of, of attitudes across um, you know, a representative sample of Irish people uh, looking at public and private sector, looking at workers and employers. Um, so we commissioned this, it was carried out in the field by Behaviour and Attitudes last month. Um, and I just wanna take you very quickly through some of the top line findings. So just to be clear, uh, we offered a definition of a four day week um, as being the same job, the same goals and the same salary, but over four days rather than five. Um, and that was offered to, to all respondents to the survey. 
just to ensure that I suppose the definition of a four day week um, obviously as a campaign, we, we uh, are campaigning for a shorter working week for all workers across the public and private sector. But there are different forms of four day weeks, which we've seen. And we wanted to be clear that we were talking about something that meant the same pay and the same outputs and productivity expected, um, but with, with different working time. Uh, and as I said, this was conducted over the second half of, uh, of August. Uh, and it's it's representative in line with the uh, political opinion polls that you would you would see in the in the newspapers. So this is the questionnaire that we used. And um, so the first question, very briefly, is around uh, achievability, and it asks: Given advancements in technology, do you believe a four-day week is a realistic and achievable ambition in the medium term? Uh, and we reiterated the definition. The second question uh, asked. If you believe that trialing a four day week in your own place of work without loss of pay or productivity would be both desirable for employees and feasible for the employer. And we probed on both of those questions first as to whether it will be desirable for employees and second as to whether it will be achievable for employers. The third question asked to what extent would you support or oppose the government exploring the introduction of a four day working week? And that mirrors a question that was asked in the UK in their survey a couple of months ago. And then finally, we asked a question just to allow for demographic breakdowns across public and private sector, types of work, sectors and grades. So I'm not going to go into this in detail, but just say the sample profile um, is, is uh, broadly in line with, with other surveys of this type in terms of the breakdown between working and non-working. Uh, around four in five response, re responses were from employees uh, and around a fifth were from employers. Um, and then you can see a range of different responses across different sectors. Around three quarters of respondents were from the private sector, a quarter from the public sector, and then around four in five were full-time workers with around a fifth part-time workers. Uh, and again, a range of different grades covered as part of the survey uh, and a sample of, of 1,020, which gives you a margin of error of around 2.8%. Just again, very quickly in terms of the analysis of the working sample, uh, under 25s, around 20%, uh, 25 to 34 is 22%. So as you can see, a, a range of, of different ages covered uh, with about 10% over 65. And then in terms of uh, social status, 32% uh, ABC1 um, and, and, and so on. So I'm just going to move on to the findings. We can obviously share uh, each of these slides um, with, with, with attendees after the event. But the first headline finding is that two in three people feel that a four day week is a realistic and achievable ambition. And um, this was stronger amongst uh, younger people, but not by a, a huge amount um, and, and greater scepticism uh, among self-employed farmers and older adults. And um, so, as you can see, about two in five strongly believed that a four day week is a realistic and achievable ambition in the medium term. 27% uh, broadly believe that it's achievable. And then if you look at um, the remaining third of respondents, the vast majority are unsure, um, while only a small number, 14% in total, don't believe that it's either, um, uh, don't believe it's achievable or at all achievable. So very positive findings, um, which show a significant demand, appetite and support for a shorter working week amongst the Irish population. And um, that's broadly the same between men and women, around two thirds uh, for both. Uh, and as you can see, um, the largest support is among the 25 to 34 age group. It's still around two thirds between the 35 to 65 age group. And then that falls off to just over half amongst the over 65 age group. Um, in terms of responsibility, just over half of employers, 53% of employers felt that it was realistic and achievable and around three quarters of employees uh, felt that way. And as you can see, again, public and private sector and um, both with two thirds or more saying that it was realistic and achievable. So not a huge gap uh, between the public and private sector. The headline responses then in, in, our, in terms of our second question were I suppose the, well, the first question was in general terms, how achievable a four day week was. With this one, we drill down into the, the specific conditions within the, the workplace setting of the respondents of the survey. 
and we asked them if trialing a four day week without loss of pay or productivity would be feasible within their own workplace. And again, you can see um, around three quarters of respondents felt that it would be desirable for employees. And then around uh, three fifths of respondents felt it would be achievable for employers. And that's the overall figures. You'll see then in the box um, on the slide that it shows the breakdown by employer and employee. So around 70% of employers felt that this would be desirable for the employee. 85% uh, of employees felt that a four day week uh, without loss of pay or productivity would be desirable for workers. Um, and then in terms of achievability for employers, around two thirds of workers felt it would be achievable for their employer. Well, just under half of employers felt that it would be achievable for them. Now, it's important to say because um, the employer respondent, uh, respondent base is obviously a sample of the overall sample, the margin of error on that is closer to 6%. So it, there's not really a statistically significant um, difference there. It's roughly half, just below half of employers surveyed. And I think that's really encouraging at this point in the campaign that there, there seems to be a real openness amongst the business community. And that would be in line with our experiences of talking to employers and their representatives about the potential for moving towards a shorter working week. Um, I'm not going to go, go into the detailed breakdown just for time reasons, um, but, but obviously the slides will be, will be available. That just shows that the breakdown by full-time, part-time, public-private, uh, and so on. Um, I just want to move on to the, the final uh, area that we looked at, which was around whether the government should explore, actively explore the introduction of a four day working week um, and I suppose assess the feasibility of introducing this in different sectors of the economy. Um, so as you can see, amongst all adults, just under half, 48% would strongly support government exploring this and um, around 30% would generally support that. And again, very similar to, uh, to, to previous questions, the opposition is very minimal, around 6%. And um, so those who aren't supportive broadly fall into the neither support nor oppose category. And that's broadly in line with the, with, the, uh, with the response that we got in terms of people saying they were unsure as to how achievable it was. I think that's a job for us in this campaign, I suppose, to, to get the, the message out there uh, in terms of the, the, the section of the population who are unsure about this concept. Then we just have a breakdown of all working adults. Uh, results very similar, uh, slightly higher numbers, strongly uh, supportive of uh, the government exploring a four day week and a, a slightly smaller amount of people uh, unsure and, and saying that they'd neither support nor oppose. So this actually surpasses the, the levels that we saw in the UK where it was around two thirds. Here it's around three quarters uh, supporting government exploring this. Um, but the patterns are very similar and this is in line with the kinds of responses that we've seen to industry surveys that have been carried out and also trade union surveys that have been carried out. Um, so I'm just going to move towards a uh, conclusion and um, when you factor out the undecideds um, the result is, is pretty uh, unambiguous. Um, so as you can see here, when you take out those that are not really sure or neither support nor oppose, uh, you've got 18% say it's not realistic and achievable and 82% say that it is. Uh, and then on the second question around should it be trialed, um, only 7% oppose a trial. Uh, the vast majority, 93% would be in favour of a trial. So just in summary, uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a very enthusiastic result, um, not just among employees, but, but a significant proportion of employers believing that this is something that's feasible in their own workplace setting. Um, consistently stronger results uh, with, with younger people and people working uh, in full-time occupations. And as I said, um, enthusiasm am amongst both employers and employees for the government exploring the introduction of a four day working week. Um, so I'm just going to uh, finish sharing those slides. So in, in summary, um, as a campaign, I suppose we're very much looking at this not as an immediate thing whereby the government would legislate for it across all sectors tomorrow. I think it's clear that in the same way that the five day working week, the nine to five is the standard work arrangement across the economy today. 
that it's not the only work arrangement. And really, we're talking about a gradual, steady and managed transition towards a shorter working week for all. And within that, there will need to be different forms of flexibility for both employers and employees. But we think the results are very clear that there's a real appetite for this to be looked at in much greater detail. And uh, what we're calling on specifically as a campaign is for the Oireachtas Committee on Enterprise, Trade and Employment to commission an expert report on the four day working week and to add this to their work programme, engage with stakeholders, look at the international evidence and examples that are out there and come back with a, with a report on how feasible this would be in different sectors of the economy. I think just before I conclude and pass over to Margaret, um, from our point of view, working time as a trade union, this has been a core trade union demand pretty much since the formation of the trade union movement. Um, a lot of the arguments that you hear against the four day working week today, that it's an unaffordable luxury, that it's not achievable, are the same types of arguments that we heard um, when trade unions were fighting for the eight hour day, the five day week and the weekend as we know it today. Um, we think if you look at the kind of productivity advancements and technological enhancements we've felt in the Western world over the last couple of decades, John Maynard Keynes, when he predicted that we'd all be working a 15 hour week back in the 1930s, would scarcely have believed the type of progress that we've made. But yet in the Western world, working hours have re remained pretty much stagnant since the early 1980s. And we're very much of the view that as we move into a fourth industrial revolution, where there's going to be greater automation of processes and systems, there's going to be a much greater use of digital technologies, that it's vitally important that we share the benefits of those advancements with workers. And as it has been throughout history, we think working time is the right place to start. So I'm going to hand over now to Margaret Cox. Margaret is the director of the ICE group, who I mentioned earlier are a company based here in Ireland, who've been working now a four day a week for more than a year. And um, so Margaret, over to you. Um, thanks, Joe. Uh, can I assume that the technology is worked and right now everybody who should hear me can hear me? Maybe a thumbs up, that would be really great. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, welcome particularly to the members of the Oireachtas who have joined us and I can see on the attendee list, aside from the people who are on the panel, there are a number of different other Oireachtas members who have joined the webinar and um, I think that's a, a true indication of the commitment of the Oireachtas and then hopefully the government to take this issue on board and to consider it in its fullest and um, in the context that the, of the change that perhaps we can make and in the context of the opportunity for leadership for Ireland as a country across Europe and the world in order to deliver um, very, very simple change but very important change to our business community, our society and to everybody who lives on the island of Ireland. So just to say, our um, ICE Group, small business on the west of Ireland. We have offices in Galway, uh, Limerick and Sligo. We work across four continents with a, a part-time office in Sydney where we work as well. Um, we have 58 full-time people and we run an agency workforce because our, our business is recruitment, training and business services in terms of outsourced business processes. So we run an agency workforce of up to 1,500 people at different times of the year. Um, so it's it's a quite it's an interesting uh, model in terms of a business. Um, we have ups and downs in our business. We we provide services across uh, five and a half, sometimes six days. So we're not your atypical five day week organisation. I think that's important to remember. When we went into this um, concept, uh, we went through a number of different stages. We went through a planning stage. Uh, to, to uh, analyse, did we, is this something that we thought we could do? Because in fairness, when it was announced and we decided to look at it as a management team, um, the, the original thought was, no, that doesn't, that's not going to suit us. We're too small, we have too many problems. And what we decided to do was, okay, let's take it a step further and do a little bit of analysis. We did the analysis. We made an announcement to our staff in May of 2019. And interestingly here, um, we were greeted with absolute silence at the staff meeting. So you can imagine a room of 50 people at the time um, and we made the announcement and we're moving to a five, a four day a week. It's going to be the same pay um, and silence. Luckily, we had a break for lunch within 15 minutes and people got a chance to walk away and think about it. Um, but when they came back, the reaction was they thought it was a joke. They thought they were on candid camera. 
um, that nothing like that could actually be possible. And I think if you see from the survey, the movement in terms of people's attitudes and business attitudes over the last uh, 12 months or 18 months has been such to say, this is something we could actually do. Um, can we think about it? Can we plan for it? Can we truly make a difference in terms of our business, in terms of our own lives, in terms of the lives of our employees and in terms of society and climate? We then implemented um, our trial period from July 2019. We reviewed it January the 1st, 2020, and we implemented it as the way we are doing our business since the beginning of January 20. And we're now in the middle of our or be coming into our second year. Things have changed as it needs to do. You make your reviews, you learn from some of the mistakes and challenges you've had to deal with. Um, and we've done that and it's been a success. We wanted from a business point of view, and I suppose that's the, the view that I'm trying to push uh, or to, to share with you today. From a business point of view, it had to make commercial business sense. You know, if we don't, if we're not in a business, if we can't run our business commercially, we can't employ people and we can't truly make a difference. Or indeed, in our own words, we can't be bloody brilliant because that's what our tagline is. Be bloody brilliant. So we wanted to reduce um, our attrition. We wanted to reduce our short term absences. We wanted to reduce staff travel time. We wanted to maintain productivity. We wanted to maintain sales and we wanted to maintain costs. So they were our six key measurables. What actually happened, and I'm conscious of time, what happened was we uh, increased our productivity by 27%. We reduced our staff travel time by 20%. We got to a rate of zero unplanned attrition. Uh, we reduced our um, costs by 12% and we increased our sales by 30%. So a significant business uh, improvement. Um, so I suppose, what is what's the message for that? The message is a small organization based on the west of Ireland on the periphery of Europe. If we can do it, most people can do it. But what we need is a will and then we need to find the way. And our challenge, and I think supported by the um, the survey, and this is a particular message, obviously, to the Oireachtas audience. The challenge there is take this on board. It's an idea. It's a change. We can be leaders in Europe. We can be leaders in the world in making life better for the people who live and work in Ireland and make ourselves more attractive as an organisation, as a country for people to come and invest in. In ICE Group, and I'm going to finish on this point, we're not looking at returning to the new normal. We're actually looking at returning to better. And part of our journey in terms of returning to better is making sure that we can, as an organisation, continue to deliver the same productivity or better, the same sales or better, the same quality of life or better to our people and ultimately maintain this four day week initiative. So on that point, Joan, I'll hand back to you to um, your next speaker. I think that's probably Orla. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Margaret. Um, so, as, Mar as Margaret said, I'm now going to pass over to Orla O'Connor. Orla is the Director of the National Women's Council of Ireland. Uh, actually, the Na National Women's Council now, uh, I, I, I misspoke. Um, so, Orla, do you want to come in? Thanks, Joe, and thanks, Margaret. And thanks to you all for, for joining with us today. I think today is a really important day for the Four Day Week campaign. These are very significant and important survey results, and it's really great um, that you, you're here and that we can share this with you. And I mean, I think overall, as Joe has said, they clearly show now the public support for a Four Day Week and that the public and workers believe that this is a realistic and achievable ambition. And I think it also shows the desire for workers, both women and men to move further now into government action in terms of how we can make this a, you know how we can make this a reality f for workers and you know for the national women's council this campaign about bringing about a four day week has really strong and positive implications for all sectors of society but particularly for women and we came into this campaign and we're, you know joined with the organizations in the campaign because we wanted a new discussion on the organization of work and of women's working lives and it's very clear to us from all of our members in the National Women's Council that women want to see a working model that incorporates a much greater balance between work-life balance and also one that accommodates care. And so it's very clear that we need to integrate care into our economic policies. 
we know, and as you all know, that women do the vast majority of care work. Women clearly see that, that a four day working week could lead to a greater sharing of care work between women and men. And that's absolutely critical if we're serious about achieving equality in our society. And also, I think the other issue that is, is one of the drivers in terms of the four day working week for, for the members of the Women's Council is that so much of the decisions regarding women's working lives are severely limited because of this failure to integrate care with into our employment policies. And that's one of the main reasons why women often get very limited in low paid, short term employment. So, so that, that's a critical piece in this. And it's very critical if, if we also want to reduce the gender pay gap. So, so for us in the Women's Council, transforming our working model is absolutely necessary. And we believe that the four day week is a core part of how we could achieve that transformation. I think as well, one of the things over the last number of months we've been, you know, in terms of the work that we've been doing in the Women's Council has been on the impact of living with COVID and the impact on, on, on women's lives. And it's very clear to us that in, in trying to do that, um, over the past number of months, that it's raised many questions about our traditional working model. And I think the survey is reflecting that. I think it is showing, a bit like what we've seen as well in terms of the general election, it's showing an appetite for change, that there is a real appetite for change in terms of, of a new model of work. And, and I, I think that's one of the things that's very much reflected in terms of the results that we're seeing in the survey. So just to finish, I mean, I really think there's an opportunity now um, and that's why it's so good. I think that so many, you know, TDs and senators are here because there is an opportunity in terms of taking this further, moving it into the Oireachtas and specifically considering, OK, how can we take this four day working week and how can we develop it into a model that will work in Ireland? Thank you. Thanks very much, Orla. Um, so I'm now going to pass over to Oisin Coughlin. Oisin is the Director of Friends of the Earth Ireland. Thanks, Joe, and it's really good to be with you all in this uh, slightly strange new world of, of our Octus briefings. Um, it's nice to change from the AV room, I suppose. Um, we're very happy to be part of this campaign as, as Friends of the Earth. Um, we obviously think a four-day working week would be uh, beneficial for the environment. It would reduce, for example, commuting uh, and associated pollution. But we actually also think, and that's why we're very happy to be part of it, that it's beneficial for workers, as Joe has outlined, for women, as Orla has outlined, and actually for well-being being generally. We really, we really see uh, this campaign as a, for us as a way also to talk about climate action in a more holistic and, and positive way. Climate action is often framed and debated as being about a cost and a burden and they already talk about you know, increasing the carbon tax and the budget is coming up. Whereas in fact, and it's often also framed as being about individual change in response to this external uh, threat of climate change. Whereas we see climate action as being much more about changing the systems that we that we rely on uh, for, for, for our economy and for our society, the energy system, the transport system, our buildings and food systems, so as uh, uh, less polluting options are available for everybody, at, uh, are accessible and affordable for everybody. Uh, and some of those changes can only be made by made by government. And equally, in this campaign, it's about changing uh, our work system, not asking individuals to take on new responsibilities or to make shifts to be less polluting, but actually looking at, at the overall uh, work system and the culture of how we work in order to have a, a better balance uh, between well, between work and the rest of our lives, but also between uh, uh, the planet uh, and our own our own way of, of of, of living on it. Um, so th that's why we, why, why you, if you wonder about why a, an environmental organization is, is committed to this campaign, that's why, how we are, are approaching it. And I think, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the, you know, the, the, the biggest benefit uh, in, in the short term to a four day working week is the reduction in commuting times. If you, in, in, if you do very simplistic maths about it, you know, if it's, if everybody is working one day less a week, well, then you have a fifth less of the, of the, on average, the, of, of the associated pollution. And we know that, uh, in case you don't know that, that in terms of Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions, the share of of those emissions that come from transport, and a lot of that is commuting, has doubled between 1990 and now. That's the share, and the overall pollution from transport.
transport has more than doubled uh, over that time. So transport emissions are a significant part of, of the challenge we face. And as you know, uh, we, we need to have our emissions, at the very least, the government's committed to having our emissions over the next 10 years. Our fair share is more than that, and the European Union is actually already looking at, at, at saying a 55% target. So we have to reduce emissions across the board, and this is of one way of doing that in a way that is uh, beneficial uh, and has uh, benefits, not costs. It's not a, it's not a burden. It's, it's good for business. It's good for uh, uh, society to do it this way. And I think the COVID, the COVID experience has shown us, uh, as Orla mentioned, that we are actually capable of of doing really significant changes in, in a short period of time and there can be silver linings to even the worst circumstances as is the case with COVID. And in the case of COVID we saw that suddenly commuting ceased to be the cent a central activity of our, of our working day and congestion reduced, pollution reduced and uh, commuter frustration uh, reduced. And while we had to struggle to, to adjust to working from home, those of us who had the luxury of working from home, uh, it also did give us that bit extra bit of time and you saw people reconnecting with nature in a way that you know we didn't expect to be part of, of, of our coping with the pandemic and i do i do think the kind of extra time that uh, a four-day working week would give us would give us that time to take a breath to pause and to reconnect with, with nature in a way that would actually uh, have a shift in consciousness that would that would mean the benefits of a four-day working week from an environmental perspective would be much greater than simply the, the the numbers on the spreadsheet in terms of the reduction of transport emissions, for example. Uh, that it would be part of of a, just a readjustment, a reconnection, uh, and allow us to uh, to to think about the bigger changes we need in, in our society and to be supportive of those, and to be to not to fear the changes we need to make in order to avoid the abrupt the abrupt disruptions we'll get if we don't tackle climate change now so we think there are really positive benefits uh, not just for the environment but for workers and for women and for society in general uh, from this and we look forward we think that actually the survey results are really strong in this regard the next step is for the government to uh, explore the introduction of a four-day working week and and particularly the campaign is asking for the uh, the enterprise trade and employment Oireachtas committee that's in the process of being set up to explore this themselves to, to commission an expert report and to have a deliberative process of the committee and therefore it's great to see uh, Louise O'Reilly who's on that committee on the panel here and I see in the audience that uh, Morris Quinlivan who chairs that committee is there so we'd ask we'd ask it's really over to you guys now uh, TDs and senators who are on that committee to to um, take this up this and to uh, to explore it further and see how it can be done thanks Joe okay thanks for that Oisin I just want to remind anyone who is watching as an attendee that if you put in your questions through the Q&A uh, we will hopefully get to them before the end of the event. What I'm going to do now is pass over for some contributions from our uh, political representatives. I'm delighted to say that we have representatives from Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, Sinn Féin, Labour, the Social Democrats, the Green Party and uh, People for Profit uh, here with us. Um, rather than uh, get myself into a difficult situation of selecting the order that I'm going to go to people, I'm going to take the very unscientific method of just reading from the panellist list that I have here in front of me and going to them in the order that WebEx have presented them. So uh, I have Breed Smith as the first person. If you're happy to come in there, Breed. Okay, I think um, she is on mute and the camera isn't on, so I'll come back to, to you, Breach, um, if you get that up and running again. Uh, so next on the list here is Aon Rirvan. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, I'll be as brief as I possibly can. And I think, uh, as we as we've all seen in the past, working in the Oireachtas, that the Oireachtas committee structure, as has been outlined um, by the presentations, is is the best way to move this forward. Obviously, the Labour Party, as others here, are, are in support of this campaign. We've seen issues of uh, a supposed divide, divisive nature, uh, being trashed out in the committee, and people with a particular point of view have actually come to a, to a, an opposite point of view after. You know, we had testaments from 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 outside agencies, from unions, and from business leaders. And and having a cross party uh, report from a committee gives a minister of the day or the government of the day a level of cover that this has been teased around. This is something that is not on the edges of uh, of society. It's now mainstream. And I've seen it on the issue of traveller ethnicity. I've seen it on the issue of uh, of drug decriminalisation. Uh, I've seen it on uh, on various different issues that were were outside the mainstream, if you like, and now come into the mainstream because. Uh, uh, a committee took 
to control of it. So I think that that is definitely the way to go. Um, if we could get agreements, I suppose, around the political table here, that it could be prioritised at the committee level, and then to have a, a, a very sort of tight timeline of when a report would be commissioned and then and then um, signed off, then that would be a powerful symbol that the that the Roxas Committee on Enterprise Trade and Employment is now in agreement with a four day week. Uh, for the for for the for the various reasons outlined, and then as I say, it makes it easier then for government to to accept it. But that that would be a really a really positive process. So within that, the Labour Party will do whatever we can um, to bring as many agents on board with that process as possible. Uh, and I think it, it doesn't have to be divisive. It's something as has been been said uh, can benefit everybody, and also in particular, um, you know, environmental concerns, but to benefit families. One thing I would say is that. Uh, and not to not not to make a, a very a very political point, but um, I think over the course of the pandemic, issues of of economy uh, ha have come to the fore, and issues of childcare and education have probably slipped down the list. And 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 they are the type of issues that that a four day week will really really benefit. Um, and finding the proper balance between between work uh, and uh, and outside work life. But that's that's my contribution. I, I'm trying to be as as practical as possible. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Eon, and thanks for being uh, relatively brief. And um, because I forgot to tell people to be relatively brief, so um, I see Breathe is back on the camera. So, Breathe, if you're able to come in for a quick contribution, that'd be great. I think you're on mute there. And um, if you're able, oh, there you go. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Th thanks very much for setting this up. It's very. Uh almost like historical that you're doing this because, as you said in your introduction, uh, workers had to campaign for an eight hour day and for a weekend. And all those historical contexts, I think, are important to remember in this. So um, we're starting from a very strong position or, 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 or the campaign is starting from a very strong position, having all this cross party participation, as well as the surveys and stuff that have been done. I suppose as we go along, there, it will raise a number of questions. And uh, I was interested to hear the contribution from the business uh, sector there earlier on about how productivity went up. And one of the things that I think we need to be a wee bit careful about when we talk about productivity and shortening the working week is that we don't offload too much pressure onto workers to fit too much into the four days, because already a lot of my friends and a lot of my friends' children are exhausted working from home and being forced to work 10 hour days because of the situation we're in. So we need to find, obviously there's going to be loads of discussion about how we do this, but we need to find ways of not pushing too much into too uh, short a space of time. I absolutely think it's a great idea. And the question of it being linked to no loss of pay in fact, if according to what the, the woman from Galway said earlier on, if productivity levels do rise, then there's an issue of increased pay rather than keeping it at a static level. But I, I just think we need to be aware that we don't want to put any more pressure on workers in their working days, albeit reduced to four, that, the, that, that they should be comfortable and safe and not uh, uh, over stressful on them. And um, thank you for organising this. I'm very happy to join in the fray with this campaign. It's a brilliant move forward. OK, thanks very much, Bree. So just to let people know, I'm working in the following order. I'm going to go to Emer next, then Jennifer, then Louise, then Malcolm, then Roisin. Um, so Emer Curry, Fine Gael Senator. Everybody, can you hear me OK there? OK, and you can see me. Um, so, yes, my name is uh, Emer Curry. I'm a senator. I was a, a councillor up until um, June. Um, the, to be honest, the, the results uh, don't particularly surprise me. I think um, workers especially have been uh, ahead on, uh, on the issue of changing how we work for a while now. Um, uh, we have seen, like last year, there was, there was a survey that said that more people wanted flexibility over a pay rise. Um, and, and and your own research would have said that 86% 86, 86 of people wanted to continue to, to work remotely um, or have access to some sort of remote and now 77% around a four day week. So the appetite for change has been there uh, and, and growing for a long time. Um, the, the businesses have been somewhat slower to, to catch up. Um, the businesses that, that do get engaged uh, with changing how we work 
they do see productivity increasing. Um, and we've seen that over the last couple of years, reduced costs and in, an increase in, in retention. Um, and I think what the what the pandemic has done is kind of lifted the veil for for other companies that were suspicious that there is a new way of working uh, that can work and there can be structural change. Um, and I, I think we very much have to encourage that. And I also think that um, men have particularly seen that there are there are benefits to flexibility o over the, the last few months. I think women have had a rougher ride because they have been trying to to, to manage a lot of the domestic duties um, and look after their, their work. Um, but there is so much that we can do here. There's so much opportunity for change. In the programme for government, there has also been an, an acknowledgement around change. Um, and it has said around 20% committing to 20% for remote working. And uh, we've had a consultation on, on remote working. We've had a consultation on, on flexible working. Um, and, and importantly, I think we've seen a commitment to change how we measure things, that, that it's not just about econ economics, it is about well-being. And I, I definitely see the structural change being part of that. And um, what I'd like to say is that that is something that that could be about flexibility for all and um, the four day week, uh, you know, there's there's compressed hours as Breed mentioned, we do have to be to be careful about people, um, uh, you know, packing everything into into a four day week. But there are other other ways of doing flexibility like compressed hours or annualized hours and remote working. And I think we need to, to look at all of them. And um, the benefits are there from a gender perspective. I'm somebody that left my job because of a lack, a lack of flexible work. And then, you know, five years later, I find myself in, in, in the Shannon. And um, so, you know, the, the benefits are definitely there. But we this is an opportunity that's not just about gender. It's, it's about quality of life in, gen, in general and getting the work life balance right, the environmental balance right and also regional balance and making sure, especially with remote, that we are um, that we're looking at at working opportunities all around the country. So there, there is the EU um, directive on um, the work life balance, and I think that's going to be key in all of this. Uh, the, the member states have, have three years to look at that, and I think we need to go much be much further beyond the the basic requirements of that, and consider this report and this research and the structural change that that is needed around how we work within that. Okay, um, thanks so much for that, Emer. Um, appreciate it. So I'm just going to pass over now to Jennifer Whitmore, who's TD for the Social Democrats. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, and I'd just like to say thank you for organising today, but also for keeping the campaign going. It's uh, a really important discussion that we need to be having, um, particularly in light of, of you know, our experiences during COVID. What's really interesting is the data that you have collected now, because I think you know, most of us in our gut knew that we needed to be moving towards better work-life balance, um, but now we have the data to back it up. And not only does it demonstrate that there is a real demand out there amongst employees, but actually employers, which is really important to have them on board as well. Um, and it's great to see that there is a, a positive, positive feedback from them in this regard. The Social Democrats are uh, you know, obviously very supportive of this campaign. It's something we, we included in our manifesto. Um, our experiences of bringing through the unpaid parental leave bill a couple of years ago, um, it really demonstrated to us there was huge support for it. So, so what that was, was that it gave uh, parents an additional eight weeks unpaid parental leave. And we had a lot of really positive feedback from it. But it was unpaid because it was um, because it was an opposition bill. We couldn't actually put anything through that would cost the state money. So we could only put it through as unpaid. But even as unpaid leave, it got huge feedback. Um, but we would like to see that broadened. And I think you know there is a need for flexibility with working for people who are carers, who might be looking after elderly parents, you know, or people who can't afford to take unpaid leave. So this is this is a really important move um, that we're making. I personally have worked a four day week. Um, I did it when my children were very young and it gave me great flexibility. Um, and it was a really positive experience for me and my family, but also for my employer as well. So it worked very well for me so I can see the benefits of it. I know personally what the benefits are um, and I would be really um, highly supportive of, of this of this campaign. So but thank you very much for for bringing it to the fore. And uh, yeah, we will sometimes we'll do whatever we can to support you in it. Thanks very much, Jennifer. And um, so now we have Louise O'Reilly, TD uh, from Sinn Féin and also their Employment Affairs spokesperson. 
Uh, good morning, and thanks very much, uh, Joe, for organising this, and thanks a million for the for the research because it is extremely interesting. Um, I think there is definitely a role for the committee. Um, if I want to be a bit tongue in cheek about it, uh, I would say, as a former trade union organizer, uh, I, I never waited for the government to legislate. I, I got out, I organised, and I tried to do it. And I think there has to be a twin track approach. It can't just be waiting for legislation because if you look at the legislative programme that's just been published, there isn't a word in it about uh, about workers' rights. So we may be a long time waiting for, for that to come. But I do think there is a really uh, clear role for the committee to take a, a look at this and a broader view. It's a couple of things that strike me um, when I when I look at and when I when I consider and I, and, uh, and contemplate a uh, four day week. Absolutely, there are benefits. There are serious benefits in terms of fewer people commuting um, and there are serious environmental benefits that's a given. Um, and there are obviously work life balance benefits and, and et cetera, et cetera. And we heard from Margaret, you know, that there's not necessarily hostility among employers to this because it can be seen to, to make a lot of sense. But on the other side, how does that work for a cleaner who's hourly paid? You know, I mean, of course, she can work four days a week. Her boss is like, but you just don't work. You work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You don't work on Friday. You don't get paid. So, or else you work your your forty hours in in your four days. So, that has to be looked at. You know, there are people who um who can't be encompassed by this unless a bit of work is done to bring them in. And I think it's extremely important that we would do that work. Um, for low paid workers, uh, for people who are hourly paid, they can't be excluded. This is something that makes a lot of sense if you're working in like a Facebook or somewhere like that. We are office based and you can say, well, all right, I can do all of my work because I start on a Monday. I have tasks that have to be completed. And if they're completed by Thursday, happy days, I'm, uh, I, I, I can do my four day week. If you're a cleaner working in Beaumont Hospital this morning, you, you can I mean, obviously you can do your 40 hours in the space of four days, but who wants to work 10 hours? Uh, 10 hours a day clean and do you know what I mean so that we really need and I think that's where the committee will actually come into its own in terms of being able to tease that out and produce a report and I know um, Maurice Quinlivan uh, the TD for Limerick is the chair of the committee I think he's on this morning I know he's to step out uh, to, to do an interview so I know he's in and out but Tony from his office is on um, you know and we will be we'll be looking at this I'm happy as I'm already appointed a committee member there so I'm happy to ensure that I bring this uh, to the committee uh, I will say to you, I've asked that they would prioritise uh, looking at legislation um, that would prevent tactical insolvencies in the first instance. And I don't want to be writing 100 letters going, I want this prioritised and this and this and this. But I definitely see uh, we have an absolute role um, as a committee to look at this and to look at it in the round. Because if it's, if it's going to work, and I think it can, I think, it, I think it's really important um, that we have the discussion, but it has to work for everybody. It can't be upstairs, downstairs about this. We have to have something to say to low paid workers. We have to have something to say. Um, you know, and then you're, you're, you know, obviously you're coming into your living wage and and uh, and that kind of discussion, which I think has to necessarily be uh, be part of it. Um, but I would like to see on the other side uh, a couple of examples, and we we heard it there from Margaret, but a couple of examples coming from uh, from the unions where they've organised for this, where it's where it's happened, and where it's working, because I think that's going to inform as much as anything else. You know, there, there is a very awful culture of presenteeism. I, I was talking to somebody who works for one of the big. Um, I won't say which one, but you know where they are all around Barrow Street. Um, and the, uh, the, you know, what they what they were saying to me, only a young person, they were saying, oh, it's great, you know, we, we get fed when we're there and, you know, all of this. Like, nobody wants to be paid in food. You get paid in money, you go home when your work is done. It's this culture of, you know, I want to be here because everybody's here and, you know, that that you nearly give your life to the company for, for the sake of a, a stand on every floor with, uh, with, with food and stuff on it. That has to be, I think, fairly uh, challenged and, and met head on. But I think the committee is the ideal place to do it because we get the opportunity Opportunity to bring in all those examples, and we need to hear from, from people like Margaret who can come in and say, actually, this worked. I'm not, not to be afraid of. And I, I think there's a there's a job of work for the committee to do. And certainly, I will be uh, recommending it to, to Morris and recommending that we produce a report, take a look at it. But it has to be something that is inclusive. It can't just be for one uh, for one great group or category of worker. It has to work, and if in order for it to work, it has to work for uh, for the vast majority or for as many workers as possible. Thanks for that, Louise. Uh, just before I pass over to Malcolm, just to say a couple of things in terms of where the campaign stand on, on a couple of points you raised. 
First of all, we see it as very much a three-way approach. We think that a huge part of this is, is worker demand and trade union organisation. And I think as trade unions, we need to ensure that this is one of the core bargaining demands that we have as a movement in the years to come. Uh, we think there's a role for business leadership, for companies like Margaret's, uh, who see the opportunities that this brings and for stepping up and trialling it and introducing it. And then we think there's a role for government to facilitate um, you know, both the public sector where they have direct control and also facilitate through legislation or through policy uh, companies in the private sector to be able to introduce this and, and to be supported to do that. So we definitely think that it's not government pass a law tomorrow to make this happen. It's absolutely a, a three-way approach. Um, I'm going to bring in Malcolm now uh, from Fianna Fáil, Fianna Fáil Senator Malcolm Byrne. Uh, hi, Joe, and thanks very much for organising it. Uh, I was conscious uh, when you started that you uh, you made reference to uh, J.M. Keynes and where he predicted that by, in 1928, in fact, that within 100 years, because of the advances in technology, uh, we'd only be working an average of 15 hours. So your challenge is within the next eight years uh, to, to reduce the working week uh, to 15 hours. I, I can't quite see that happening. Um, but I think the, at the time, the first major company globally that, that did move to the, um, the five-day week uh, was Henry Ford and, and the Ford company. And Ford did it because he saw uh, the benefits of productivity uh, from the workers within, within Ford plants uh, being able to work uh, five-day weeks. Don't, don't doubt the, uh, the vision of a cork man. Um, but I think it, it, it's key that any of the decisions that we make around this, that, that, that it's evidence-based. Uh, and that's why listening to Margaret Cox's testimony is going to be really important. Uh, like Jennifer, I had the experience, I was fortunate to be able to move uh, for a while to a four day week. I've been able to benefit um, from remote working. And I think that when we hear the experiences of people who've had the opportunity uh, to have four day weeks and, and the flexibility that that has allowed, uh, along with the evidence uh, for, for companies uh, where we have seen additional, uh, uh, you know, that it doesn't have an impact on productivity and in many cases is more positive. Uh, I think that evidence-based approach um, makes a lot of sense. I think we can, we can certainly learn from the experience in France when the 35-hour uh, week uh, was introduced in France. Uh, that worked in certain sectors and it didn't work in others. Um, and I think there are learnings from, um, from that experience as to the reasons uh, as to why uh, that will be the, the case. Um, I, I, the nature of, and I, I know some of the speakers have, have, uh, have touched on it, Emer touched on it, Jennifer did as well, uh, around the nature of our workforce and, and workplaces and how it's, it's entirely changing. Um, we're seeing a lot more people working in the gig economy. We're certainly seeing the idea of, you know, your standard nine to five week is, is, is totally changed. People are a lot more used to remote working. And, and during the period of this pandemic, I'm here in Gorey and Wexford, I'm meeting people here who normally would have been commuting four to five days a week uh, to Dublin. They're now in Gorey in, in the middle of the week. Uh, that has, as, as Emer mentioned, really important benefits uh, for regional development, um, but also in terms of how those people can contribute uh, toward our local community, where before, because they were working long hours, they were commuting, they didn't have the time uh, to be able to do that. And, and obviously, as Oshin mentioned, from an environmental point of view, um, you know, th that, that's going to be crucial. So I, I certainly see, and the programme for government is very strong about how we look at supporting remote working. Uh, I see the challenges around remote work working tied uh, into uh, moving towards uh, a, a four day week. I, I would disagree slightly. I know, I know Louise's point about Google and some of the other companies, but I think the difference is that I think now that in the past where particularly for younger workers, they might just have looked at, you know, what, what is your pay? Uh, and, th and that is essentially it. It's now looking about the whole package, which is tied to quality of life issues, which is tied about, you know, are employers providing childcare? Uh, you know, are they providing additional resources for education and training? Uh, and I think it's, it's about looking at, uh, at, at, at that whole package. Um, but I think on the basis that if this discussion is evidence-based and certainly from what we've been hearing from Margaret and from the research, Joe, uh, I think that it, 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 it makes a lot of sense. I think taking it through uh, the committee uh, will make a lot of sense. I, I certainly know from talking uh, to other Fianna Fáil colleagues uh, that there is an openness uh, to this 
uh, and thank you for your work on this campaign. Hey, thanks very much, Malcolm. Uh, so I'm now going to go to our final political rep, um, which is Senator Roisin Garvey from the Green Party. Roisin, you're still on mute there, I can see. Oh, there we go. Wow. Uh, yeah, that was that's been amazing. Um, yeah, my my brain is expanding just from listening to those four speakers. Uh, so thanks for the invite. First of all, um, as a math physics uh, major and a background in climate um, behavioral change, I love a good research study with great figures. It's a very good starting point. So well done on the research. Um, I just have a few questions, actually, more so because it, um, it's it's an interesting one for me. Uh, I went back to a four day week when I became a county councillor last May a year ago. Uh, so straight away, my income was reduced by a fifth. My workload wasn't in, in, in reduced at all. So I, I'm I'm very passionate about the four day week uh, coming to fruition, but being done in, in a really clear and fair way. Um, I'm also the spokesperson for enterprise trade and employment. So I, I'm happy to work with uh, work with, work with the list uh, through the committee um, on the political side of things. Um, thinking about it as a campaign, um, I just had a few questions. I, I think the the ICE group are a great example. I was going to ask Margaret uh, two things: how how long they've been doing it for, and how um, how they initiated it, and how long it took them to be going. Yes, it's working. That's brilliant. We're we're on a winner here, you know, because it uh, st the statistics saying that the increase of productivity and all that is really positive. I'm just curious as to um, how how long it took to feel that this was working. And um, I also had a question for Oshin. It might be useful if we're going to support the campaign to have some specific figures on carbon emissions from commuter transport to back up the four day week as well. And um, with regards to the Women's Council, I, I as a single mother myself, who had to deal with childcare issues working full time, um, I completely see how this would be a huge benefit to women moving better and increasing their um, access to work. Uh, I was wondering if there's any stats the Women's Council could help to support the idea, looking at the challenges around childcare and the costs, and uh, not just for single parents, but for both parents, because that's a huge issue. And um, Lastly, I think uh, I, I will definitely support and commit myself to supporting a commission um, looking into this properly, um, as you requested, Joe. And I think that was it. There was one more thing. Oh, yeah, I was curious as to if, if, if I speak for doing it, have you approached other companies about trying to do it um, in the private sector? Or maybe there are lots of other companies um, in the private sector that are doing this successfully. Um, I think that's it. Looking forward to working with you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Roisin. I'm going to come in on a couple of questions you asked there. Then I'm going to go to my three colleagues for a final contribution and uh, maybe a response to, to what they've heard uh, before we wrap up. So just in relation to carbon emissions, I can send you on. There's about there's a number of studies and um, one from Chalmers University in Sweden. They all estimate that somewhere between 16 and 25 percent reduction in carbon emissions through a uh, reduction in commuting and reduction in energy use in, in buildings. And um, if we were to move to a four day week, um, but I, I will I will follow up with you on, on, on that. Um, and there was one of your other questions I was going to come in on. It's left my mind, so I'm going to pass you over to. Actually, I remember now. On the companies, we were we have been speaking to a number of different companies in Ireland. We we're looking at trialing this. We've been linking them in with people like Margaret, also people like Andrew Barnes, who uh, has done this in New Zealand uh, and is actively involved with the campaign, just to share experiences of businesses who have done this and made it work, uh, and to assist them, assist them in their process of uh, of transitioning to it or trialing it. Um, we have seen a number of companies who are looking at doing this early this year that paused their um, trial as a result of the, the huge change that the pandemic brought about. But I do definitely think that in the in the very near future, we're going to see a lot more companies uh, looking at this and uh, and hopefully introducing it. So I'm going to go in reverse order on the speakers that we heard earlier. So Oshin, then Ola, and then Margaret, and then I'll wrap up. 
Hi, thanks, Joe. Um, just well, um, uh, on your direct question, Roisin, um, we can look at the figures in Ireland as well to see, and, and they can be disaggregated, I'm sure, around transport to see what the, what the content of that is, uh, how much of that is, is commuting. But, but as Joe mentioned, the, the impact isn't just from commuting, it's from energy use as well. Uh, and and the, those studies are probably the, the, the best ones to look at, the ones he's proposing <laughs> to send you. Um, fine, my final comment is just, it's really great to see such a, a, a great turnout uh, from Oroctus uh, members and indeed Oroctus staff today. Uh, and really good to hear the positive indications from those who are on the committee that they will actively look at, at taking up this issue and, and, and uh, examining it and from the parties who are here who aren't yet directly represented on that committee to say that they're they're open to that too. So I think that I, I agree with those who've said that is the most practical way forward, that a committee is a good space to, to tease this out and to draw on evidence and experience from Ireland and from beyond, uh, and then to make concrete, concrete cross-party recommendations that we can all we can all push for. Thanks very much. Thanks, Oshin. Orla? Yeah, I mean, just to come back specifically, maybe on one or two of the points, um, and, you know, Roshin, in terms of the points, I mean, I can get your stats in terms of childcare, but, I mean, I suppose the, the, the clearest one is the fact that we have um, some of the highest childcare costs across the OECD. Um, but I, I think maybe the important thing to say around the childcare piece is that the four-day working week certainly moves you know would certainly provide that better a accommodation of care and better balance of working life but it's not in absence of needing strong other public services such as a public childcare model um, and that so so these things do need to go hand in hand and also i think maybe to go back to some of the points that louise was raising because i think they're important issues in terms of how this would work and particularly and particularly given that women are so much within those low paid workers that louise you were talking about i think that's why this going into an iraq this committee and teasing out those those really practical issues that are so important in terms of what the model would look like. That's why I think that 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 this is is you know this is a way to tease those things out. And I think it's really good your comments back in terms of saying that you think that that could that could be a possibility. Thank you. Thanks, Orla. Margaret. Um, thanks, Joe and uh, Roshan. Thank you for your specific questions. Just to answer them in terms of the time, we started the planning for this around February of 2019, um, and then we engaged some uh, what we called our pessimist committee in the organisation. We had about five people who worked with uh, Phil McDonald, our director, in terms of looking to see how this would work. We made the announcement in May. We went live with our trial on the 1st of July 2019. We did a review um, at the end of that. And we changed. There were a number of things that we changed between the uh, uh, 1st of July and the beginning of January to go forward then into 2020. Um, and now we're a year into it. Things that have come up during COVID in terms of issues that um, we need to deal with, how we need to be stronger, because we were now dealing with uh, people working remotely as well as on a four day week. So again, we've seen more changes uh, in that. But I guess the one of the key benefits, and I, and I failed to mention it earlier on, is our wellness scores within the organisation. They increase significantly uh, for everybody because we did various stages of uh, measuring wellness on an objective. I think it's some sort of an Oxford study or whatever. And they increase by up to 30 and 40 percent on a number of the measures. And that gave us a greater engagement and a greater resilience within the organisation to deal with the challenges that all of us have faced across Ireland in terms of dealing with work, family, education issues um, and uh, living in the, in the line of the pandemic. Can I just say, in ICE Group, we have a three-day weekend. Uh, you either work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or you work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You're off for three days every single weekend. So the idea that people need to remember is a bank holiday weekend every single weekend. What's not to love about that? But a key point, and I think it is important, Louise, you're absolutely right. We have to find a way that this works across the board. Now, the answer may not be a four day week for absolutely everybody because there are different jobs that it just doesn't translate into. But we need to make sure that we share the opportunities and the benefits across all the workforce. Otherwise, it's a failed initiative. It's got to be good for everybody, good for the company, the employees and the companies. Thanks, Joe. Thanks very much, Margaret. Uh, and I suppose just to say in, in, in summary, 
Um, when we started this campaign, we wanted to start a public conversation about a four day week and about the possibility of a shorter working week here in Ireland. Um, really, one of the things that we wanted to get across was the fact that there is no correlation between productivity and hours worked. If you look at some of the countries in Europe with the longest working hours, like the UK and Greece, they've, they're some of the least productive uh, countries within Europe. And then if you look at the OECD figures for the most productive countries, Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, they have some of the shortest working hours. And really, as a campaign, it's, it, it's really about a cultural shift away from this creeping uh, thing of working long hours in the office or in front of a screen being some kind of a badge of honour. Um, and and I, I see Edward, one of the, the, the contributors, uh, put into the chat box there that as a trade union, uh, you know, this needs to be a holistic approach. It's, you know, there's no point having a four day week if you're not able to switch off. If over those four days you're you're on call and, um, you know, right the way throughout the day. Uh, so it does need to be about not just hours, but also control over working hours. Uh, it also needs to include, you know, precarious work. So this is is, is a much wider and um, wider challenge that we have in terms of building a, and creating a future of work that's better for business, that's better for society, and that's better uh, for workers. But I think the four day week as a central plank of that, and as a real conversation starter about what a new society might look like is a really, really important one. So we've run a little bit over time. Uh, we've only got, I think, a couple of contributions rather than questions through the chat box. So I just want to thank everyone for their time, uh, their participation and their contributions um, this morning and now this afternoon. And um, we'll be certainly in touch and hopefully working with you all uh, to address this issue in the very near future. So thanks again, and we'll talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.